Welcome to the Sustainable Living Podcast. Tips, tools, and tactics for living a heart-centered life that honors Mother Earth and her inhabitants. The information shared on the Sustainable Living Podcast reflects the opinions of host Marion West, Janice Fryant, and their guests. Please use your own discretion and research before applying any information to your individual situation. Now, here are your hosts, Marion and Janice. Hi, everybody. This is Marianne with the Sustainable Living Podcast, and I'm here with Diego. Diego is the founder and the person behind Permaculture Voices. And Permaculture Voices is all over the place, really. It's a podcast, and it started out with the idea of a conference. I, we want to talk a little bit about that, but mostly I asked Diego on because he's a father and his life is kind of, as far as I can tell, very much directed towards his family. And so I wanted to talk about that. Welcome, Diego. Yeah, thank you for having me. Let's just talk really shortly about Permaculture Voices. Do you want to tell us what that is? Sure. It's a business that I initially started that was based around a conference where the goal was to educate, bring people together together share ideas and spread the word about permaculture. And through doing that at conference, it's grown over time into more of a media platform than anything. And when it comes to media, it's more audio based, think podcast than anything else. I started doing the conference. I needed a way to promote the conference. So I started doing a podcast. Once I started doing that, I kind of fell in love with the process, fell in love with hearing stories of people, telling the stories of people, and just dissecting what they're doing, asking questions. And over time, that's became the primary thing that I do around Permaculture Voices because the conferences no longer exist after three of them and just living as a memory at this point. And now all my effort for the most part, is focused on the podcast itself. There'll be some diversification into other forms of media going into 2017, but the audio format, just like you're hearing here, is really what's became my love and a good way for me to think about my life and help people at the same time. So I wanted to tell you some, I don't think I ever told you that before. So just as a little background, Diego and I know each other for quite a while. We actually met in a master composting class. And so I have met Diego when he was a brand new father. He was telling you that he created this podcast to promote the conference. And in a very early episode, you actually asked me to come on to the podcast together with Ben. And we were going to talk about food first. I was not wanting to do that because I said, oh, I have this big accent and, you know, I don't know. And now I have my own podcast. So I thought it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of funny. So I don't think you knew that I felt too shy to, <laughs> to do that at the time. You know, it's funny. I think a lot of people think that. I hear that quite often from people who I'll say, oh, you should come on the show. And they're like, oh, I'm not that good at speaking. But I think everybody is if they just, you know, talk about something that they believe in and are passionate about it, it translates well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's go back to you being a new father. I think that's when we first met. Tell us how many children you have. As of right now, three. So I don't know if that's three and done or three plus more to come, but it's it's three growing up. I don't think I ever thought I would have any kids, probably even into my early 20s. And I had one, was convinced after one I was done. My wife ended up talking me into two. I basically had two just for her. And then for our third daughter, I played switcheroo and I flip-flopped that role on her and I convinced her to have another one. So I've come full circle from somebody who never thought they would have kids to now piling on the kids, if you will. <laughs> and and I feel your children are really important in your life. So I am listening to Diego almost every day because um, actually tell us what you did when you had your third daughter and what you did with the podcast. Yeah, so my third daughter was born in late July, and what I wanted to do 
is really chronicle my life from her date of birth on. And there was a couple ways I initially thought of doing that. The first way I thought was, well, I'll do a vlog. I'll do it via video. But then I quickly realized that's more work than I want to take on. I'm more of an audio guy. So I started to do basically think of like a vlog, but only audio version. So you're just hearing what happens in my life day to day. And it ties a lot around my transition from corporate gig to entrepreneurship, my experience as a father, my general observations. The goal of this podcast is kind of multifaceted. One, it's me documenting what life is like this early on in my, all really all my daughter's life. So in theory, they will have this if they want to go back and hear what life was like when they were young and dad was young. So that's one goal. And then the second goal is really to do this daily show and help sh talk about issues that I think are pretty predominant in society, but people don't often talk about. And I've noticed from talking to a lot of people about different things from depression to miscarriage that they're much more common than many of us would ever think in society. You just don't hear about it a lot. So my goal on that show is really to try and show what's happening to me on a day-to-day -day basis, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Like if I'm struggling with something, I try and talk about it there. And similarly, when I'm celebrating something, I try and talk about that just to show the ups and downs that happen in real life, not I'm just going to show you what I want you to see. Yeah, when you first started, I was, Diego, you have three children and more work. What are you doing? <laughs> because, you know, three kids is definitely a lot of work. And I'm really appreciating that you're doing this because, as you said, you're tackling topics not everybody is willing to share. You know, we have a tendency to just show us a good and so beautiful and then everything else gets hidden. I think that makes it more difficult to deal with things, right? Yeah, I mean, work is relative, right? If if I'm stealing time from my kids, and this is a very recent learning, then I don't want to be doing that. So a lot of stuff that I'm doing when it's recording is either taking place very early in the morning before they're up or very late at night. And I get a lot of benefit out of doing this podcast beyond just the stuff that you would think, you know, spreading the word about permaculture voices, getting support through Patreon. I get a lot of therapeutic value of getting some of this stuff out of my head onto the page or onto the airwaves. It's one may way for me to brain dump some of this stuff out, which is beneficial to me. And then also, again, I have that archival value for my kids. So in a way, I could see where it's like, yeah, you're adding work. But I also wanted to show that having kids and not shutting down the rest of your life can be done. I hear a lot of people say, I mean, it's like every time you say somebody's going to be born, the first thing you always hear somebody say is, oh, you're not going to have any sleep. You better get your sleep now. And I always kind of heard that and like laughed at it a little bit because, I mean, one, I sleep fine. And then two, I'm I'm getting more work done now than I ever have with three kids because I'm prioritizing my time and I'm not, and I think I'm actually a better dad too because of this priority. So being busier has basically just eliminated stuff I didn't need from my life, like watching TV and it's just prioritized stuff like getting this message out there and spending time with my kids. It's made that easier to handle in this perverse way. So adding work has actually been very beneficial, which is not what you would think at first thought. Right. Uh, yeah, it sounds like you're getting very clear, said when you want to do this, this is how much time I have in the day and what is my priority. And what I'm hearing from you a lot is that you're making your kids a big priority in your life. Like today we are talking in the evening because you wanted to be there until your kids are asleep, right? That was the reasoning for this particular time. 
Yeah, for sure. You know, it's eight thirty right now. Now that the time change has happened, my kids are in bed by eight, so I'm trying to not steal time from them if I don't have to. Now there's a few days during the week where that happens because it has to happen. There's certain things I just have to get done during the week, but I try and mitigate the damage, if you will. And really, when I plan my week, don't have my kids and or my wife be an afterthought. They're looked at in the scheduling out of my week equally with corporate job, business, stuff that has to be done around the house, fun things. So they're part of the planning and seen on an equal plane with everything. And this is not something I would have done in the past. I've very much evolved to this. So can you talk a little bit about what happened for you to evolve into that? Was it a gradual thing? Describe a little bit your journey, if you will. So my first daughter was born July 2011, and I think it was a bit of a shocker to me because that was our first child. And I think anytime you have your first child, going from no kids to one kids is a major change because you go from being able to just pick up and do anything to well, now we have to plan ahead. We have to take a whole bunch of stuff. We have another person that's going to restrict what we can do. We can't do anything we want anymore. So we had that daughter, our first daughter, and there was that honeymoon phase of like, I'm all excited about her. And then I really started to realize, oh my God, I felt like life was constricting on me. I'm very independent. I'm very driven, or I probably still am, but I've also accepted this and I felt like I was really being throttled back by what I could do by having this, this one baby and about now in 2011. So that would have been five years ago. I was really having a hard time with it. Like to the point where I was like, I, I just need a break. I'm not getting any time to do anything I want because that was part of the shocker for me. It was there's a lot of stuff I wanted to do. And suddenly it was like, well, now I have to deal with the baby. And then just as she got older, I don't know if there's one event or what it was, but I started to realize and really take note of how quick she grows. And I wanted to make sure that she always thought of me as someone who put her first, meaning I wasn't pushing her off to go out with friends or watch TV or be on my phone or something like that. And that's gradually evolved over time. And then the moment that maybe really even stands out more, fast forwarding ahead, when she was, let's see, maybe three, so it would have been two years ago, and my second daughter was born, is my daughter, my oldest daughter, would ask me to take naps with her. And at first I was like, man, your nap time is when I get to do stuff. I get to go outside and get work done. I have you know, two or three hours to just go. And then I started to realize I'm not going to have this forever. She's not going to take naps forever. And I started to really think to myself about what am I going to value more down the line. And this is the very much the basis of all my thinking. It's it's kind of me using my future self to hold my now self accountable. And I would say, what am I going to regret more when I'm 60? That I didn't take a nap or that I didn't go outside and plant some seeds. If I planted seeds, that's going to be a zero, nothing, insignificant memory in my life. If I took a nap with my daughter, that will register. So I started to apply that lens really to everything. And gradually that's just grown to the point of when I'm home with my kids, I try to not do anything else when it's set kid time. And obviously there's some flexibility there. I mean, nobody's perfect. You can't be because life has to go on. But I really try and do that knowing that 
I don't want to look back and say, I chose something stupid over time with my kids. And also, I don't want them to say, yeah, dad always did this instead of hanging out with us. I totally love that. You know, and it's, it. I really like that you're saying you're holding yourself accountable from your future self. You know, because so many people, when they get older, have this regret said, oh, I shouldn't have worked so hard. I should have stayed with my kids more and so forth. And, you know, I'm at a place where my kids are grown and I have grandchildren now. And it's almost like the same said, I really want to make time for my grandchildren because they are growing so fast and that time doesn't come back. When they're teenagers, they're off and on their own, basically. It's such a short time. Yeah, that that scares me. I mean, that literally makes me think about things in ways I don't want. And I, I think I try and avoid the thought that they'll ever reach the teenage years. And probably early in their year, it would have been more of an issue for me than it is now. I, I've somewhat come to peace with it. So I realize that time with them is very, very finite. Uh, especially with them being daddy's girls wanting to do a lot of stuff, the the innocence that you will that comes with that young age where they just want to have fun. They're not worried about the pretentious stuff. And it just goes by quick. And I am thinking ahead, you know, my oldest daughter's five. She'll be a teen in eight years. That's not that far ahead. So I just can't waste these moments. And then eventually, as much as I don't want them to ever move out, I know they will. And I always tell my wife, you know, we're going to look back at these times and just wish that we had them back as tough as they can be. And that's the whole cruel irony of being a parent is if you zoom in on the micro scale, there's those five minutes or hour or sleepless nights that parenting is total hell and those times where you hate having kids and then you'll get a certain age at some point and wish you had them back as babies or wish they were two again or wish that they even lived at home because it won't last forever and that may sound cheesy to some people but I've talked to enough older people and i I've talked to my parents and I realize how quick this slips through people's fingers. If you don't pay attention, if you don't take the time to enjoy being a parent, it's like, why are you even doing this? Because it's not easy. Yeah, absolutely. It's not easy, but it's so valuable. I feel, I mean, I was with like you very much involved in my kid's life when they were little. And I really do think it makes a difference how your relationship is later when they're adults, because my kids and I are very close right now. And I can say it's the same for me with my birth family. I mean, my parents have passed away now, but my parents were much more of the attitude of we do for you, provide for you, but there wasn't that much of an emotional closeness. And that translates back when you're an adult. So in a sense, you are right now creating the foundation to have a very close relationship forever, I think. <laughs> no, I'm with you. And I, my parents were very much the same way. Great parents in the sense that they were providers, but they were not the emotional parents that I'm trying to be. And in many ways, I'm trying to lay the seeds now so when my daughters do reach their 20s that they'll want to hang out around mom and dad still and not just fly the coop. So there's some strategy in putting in this time now because I want them to stay around the long term. I want to have a relationship with them as long as I'm alive. I think... I could have benefited more from that if I had had that in my life. And really, one of my goals in life is to make sure that my daughters have that, that they know there's a strong support system there for them when they get older to allow them to pursue their dreams, go after things. And I don't mean just putting money behind them, but the foundational support of, 
helping them solve problems, giving them a shoulder to cry on, giving them the encouragement that they need. If they have kids, helping support them in raising those kids if they need it, because that's a huge freedom that, you know, I wish I had. We, we don't have anybody like my wife's parents aren't in the picture. My parents live across the country. So to break free at all from our kids is really tough. And I don't want my kids to have to do that all the time if they don't have to. So it's, it's starting now to cultivate that relationship. And I think that's the thing that as hard as as a parent, you know, I think a lot of society is geared now towards what type of skills can you stick in your kid's backpack, you know, math skills, sports skills, all these types of things, basically, how can they get into a better college? And I, you know, recently talked to Rob Avis, and he said something along the lines of, you know, our goal as parents is to make them to help our kids arrive at adult maturity as whole beings to be emotionally strong, to be good communicators, to be able to solve problems and take on challenges. And I think kids are born with this, and I agree with that, and I think kids are born with this innate curiosity that gets snuffed out very much in the normal school system. And if you're really trying to get a child to be a whole being at 18, you have to try and cultivate and not let that candle of curiosity burn out in the quest to just memorize facts. So, you know, this is a long-winded answer of saying there's there's a lot of strategy, I guess, in how I'm going about raising kids now, and it's evolved just past being a good dad to not just how I, I can be a good dad so I feel better in life, but how I can be a good dad to hopefully set themselves up, hopefully set those kids up, to be whole beings so they can take on the world in a way that many of us who kind of came through the system, we didn't have that, you know, going back to what you said of just parents that provided, but not always the emotional type of connection. Right. Which makes it a little bit harder to stay in your confidence and, you know, to know what you want and then to pursue it. I think you have come to a place where you're gotten very clear about you what you wanted but you did share in one of your episodes said you know at one point you had this really clear idea that you wanted to change your major in college but your parents weren't supportive of that and I feel I had a similar experience where I really wanted to do some and it was important to me but didn't fit in the plan for my parents and I think that's some I applied for my kids too. I wanted them to know what they want to do. That sounds like the direction you're going, right? For sure. I think that's key. And, you know, I think back on my parents and they are great in many ways. You know, they went out of their way to raise myself and my brother as best as they can to sacrifice a lot of their lives to make sure that we were provided for and we had a lot of opportunity, but I think a lot of the opportunity that we had is more, like I said, into this skilling up opportunity, which I don't blame them for because they grew up in the 50s and 60s and kind of came into this system that that's what you did. That's how you succeeded. But now times have changed. We've become more of a knowledge economy, more of a entrepreneurial economy. And you need to be able to kind of adapt and go with the flow. So me growing up in the 80s kind of got caught on this cusp of I grew up during this period where you had to be the the kind of corporate man and now it's swinging away from that. That's not really how the system is. So what I think my parents n- did not do a good job of is getting to understand me, who I was, what I was about why I believe some of the things I did, why I cared about some of the things that I did. So what I'm trying to do is make sure I have that connection with my daughters because you can always layer on skills. Like that stuff's easy to come by. That's commodity information. But to really know who somebody is, that makes it easier 
to help them later in life, to direct them towards opportunities, to solve problems for them or help them troubleshoot problems when they come upon them and where you can say, is this what you want to do or not? I mean, still to this day, like literally to this day, you know, I tell my parents I'm leaving my job. They're like, oh my God, why, why are you doing that? What's going on? <laughs> And it's like, oh my God, we've had these conversations for like 15 years. You still do not get it. And I do not want to have to go into that with my kids. So it's doing that, knowing now, getting to know them now, but more importantly, distilling the confidence in them that it's okay to be you, whoever you are. I have three daughters. They'll all be unique. I want them to be okay doing whatever they do. One thing that's really resonated with me more than anything in the last few years, and this was a hard pill for me to swallow, is Ben Hewitt wrote the book Homegrown. And in that book, he said, our children's stories are not ours to write. They have to live their own lives. And that, you know, was one of those things I read and it was like, just stopped me. And I think I cried reading that because that's your tendency. You want to kind of lay out the path for them, lay out their future, but really that's our future. That We're trying to impose that upon them. And reading that has really made me accept they have to write their own future. I shouldn't even be thinking about that. And I've now kind of come around to be that's okay. So now my job is to now make them confident emotionally, spiritually, so they can pursue that journey and hopefully be successful and let them define where they go on it. Let them define what happiness is. That's not for me to define. I just want to provide the support. So that's huge because that's very different from what most people think Serol as a parent is. You know, most people feel like I want you to be whatever, as engineer, as a doctor, and then do everything in their power to direct their kids towards that. I do believe that kids know what they want and we're very curious and very open to learning all the time and to adjust. If we just force their sad, they will find their way. And it might be a totally different way from what we think it is, but definitely find their way. Yeah, like me, who wanted to change my major in 1998, didn't end up really effectively changing my major until I went back to grad school in 2005. They will find their way whether we want them to or not. It's just a matter of when and how much money and time and life is that going to cost them. So why not support them in it versus try and push it off because that's what we think is best when they're probably going to do it anyway. I mean, I see this all the time from the emails I get from people that listen to the podcast. Now, I'm fully cognizant of I'm a bit of a center of gravity, so I attract this type, these types of people who are looking to change their lives. But it's amazing the people that are 30 to 50 that are like, I'm looking for meaning in my life. I want to change careers. And I'm sure if you go back to the root of why they're doing whatever they're doing, somewhere along the lines, they got pushed into doing something that they didn't want to do. Or they didn't have a system in place. I'm not just going to say it's their parents. It's very much could be the schools, guidance counselors, whomever, that didn't help them channel their innate curiosity, their innate goals and passions to do something productive. So they just said, well, this person said I should do this or I should do this because it makes a lot of money. And they did that. And now they might have fun with it for a while, but then later on they find themselves in life saying, I hate this. I never want to do it. It's been terrible. And they're looking to try and switch. And it's like, well, what if you could just do that from the beginning? Wouldn't that be a lot better? And then wouldn't the world be better if a lot of people did that? Yeah, I absolutely believe that. I do think that when we look at a lot of the destruction and, you know, things we talk about in permaculture a lot, things we want to repair, I think are somewhere down the line caused by people which lost touch with their purpose or their environment so, yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure you are kind of gravitating point for people to come to because that's really in your conferences and in your podcast, you're providing a lot of information on how to go about to live a different life. I also think there are a lot of people which kind of deep down wish they could do something different, but don't feel they can. 
And yeah, it's so much nicer if we can raise kids which have that idea, have that confidence that the world is open. Do you want to talk a little bit more about how you're changing your career and does it have to do with being a father and having a family or it was just time? Uh, it's kind of all of the above. I mean, I've wanted to move away from my corporate career for quite some time. I mean, I think initially it started around the time when we did take that master composting class, which had to be 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. And I think the initial draw was more just, I want to be self-employed. Like I was attracted to that lifestyle and being the freedom of it. And then I started the conference and it was a few years of doing that to try and use that as the tool to change. But more recently, it's became more and more important to get home, to see my kids grow up. Like the thing that was really worrying me was it's one thing to do a job that you don't like. It's another thing to do a job that you don't like and miss your kids growing up doing it. Like that reality really set in for me. Now you could say, well, you have to do that to provide for them. I fully get that. But you can also actively try and change so you can provide for them, do something you like and see them more. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do. Then seeing my third daughter born this July, I mean, that was really the kicker. Like I started to think, okay, I really have the opportunity now to see her grow from day one, pretty much to be older. Like if I can be home with that, that would be beneficial. We wanted to homeschool our kids. That just being done by my wife, like that was going to be a challenge. It was hard. Like managing three kids full time by yourself, that is a job and a half. I am not envious of her or any mother or any father in that position just doing it by themselves. After our third baby too, my wife also ran into postpartum issues and she was really struggling, drowning. And it really hit me hard to the point of where I would be like at work thinking, why am I here? I don't love this. The pay is not that great. I could get paid this much anywhere else. And she's at home struggling. And I started to worry about her, worry about the kids. That was like the uh, steroids into the system, if you will. That's what really sped it up to say, all right, I need to put a plan in place now and get things moving. And I referred to this example in the past. This was like the fissure. So there was always a fault in my life of wanting to break free. This was the fault slip that cracked and created this this fissure between the fault. And, it, and those two plates were never going to go back together. Once I knew that she was struggling and dealing with these issues, life was never going to be the same corporate-wise, career-wise for me. It just wasn't because I knew she was having a hard time. And if there's something I could do about it, I wanted to be able to do it. And I we were both willing to give up a lot to make life better for her to make life better for our kids. At this point, I primarily see myself as a dad, not a business owner, not as an entrepreneur, not as a corporate person. I've shed a lot of that. And this this process now of fast tracking this transition over has basically been driven by the need to help my wife and to see my kids grow up. I want to work from home because of that. That is the why. That's the motivation. To see them, to be around them, and to be able to help out when I can. There's second layer probably of personal fulfillment and going after it. Um, but it's not about the money. You know, I've kind of given that up along the way. And I would have never said that five years ago. I would have, there's no chance in hell I would have said that 10 years ago. It's just been an evolution. I don't know. This The universe just hit me with this brick, I guess, at the right time. And I was just receptive enough to see all these pieces. And it's really 
turned my life over. And again, I, I wouldn't have been this person at 20 years old. I just, I would have never thought this is who I would have been standing here. Yeah, I think being a parent changes a lot if we allow ourselves to sink into that, you know, because you can have a kid and then just keep on going with what you did before. But if you really allow yourself to be a full part in that relationship, I think it, it changes everything really for sure. No, I think you're right. I mean, there's, I think there's two types of parents or two types of ways to parent. And, and I don't want to criticize anyone because I think every parent tries the best that they can. Agreed. But I think there's a big difference between going through the motions and consciously trying to be a better, more active parent in your kids' lives. I'm convinced of that because initially I went through the motions and now I am consciously weighing a lot of decisions like, is this best for me as a parent? I don't think a lot of people do that. And I, I've started to see some feedback come out of episodes that I've done where this is resonating with people and people are saying, you know, I, I catch myself doing this. You know, one example would be just like, how often are you on your phone? And where are your kids when you're on your phone? Or how often are you putting a tablet in your kids' hands? I get there's times when both of those things make sense because it can be stressful with kids, but how much is that happening? And you have the choice to do that. So you become a parent, and then I think it becomes how good of a parent can you be? And it's really you against you. I mean, this is how I always try and weigh anything. You don't have to be as good of a parent as me. I don't have to be as good of a parent as you. I'm holding myself accountable. I don't want to let myself down at the end of the day. I think we all have that internal compass, if you will, that says I'm mailing it in, I'm slacking off, or I'm doing the best I can. As long as each of us, I think, has our parent compass pointed at, at the end of the day, I am honestly doing the best I can. That's all that you can do. So I always question people to say, where do you think you're lying on the scale? Could you be better? If you are, improve for yourself, improve for your kids. Don't do it for me and don't hold yourself to my standards. I'm not going to hold myself to your standards, but just measure up against yourself. We all know whether we're trying or we're not. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that you really pointed out that we know deep down if we're doing the best we can or not. And the best is very different for everybody, I think. You know, there's there's no absolute there. This is how everybody has to be. But to try to be as present and as good as we can as a parent, that's definitely a worthy goal, I say. So what I wanted to ask you before, you mentioned homeschooling. How did you come to that decision? I mean, at the core, I'm kind of anti-establishment. I think that's just who I am. So the idea of public school to me never really resonated because I just don't think that system works based on the numbers, based on the metrics. I get that there's people within that system who are trying their best. I'm fully aware of that. I think there's a lot of good people in there, but I think the system's stacked against you. I mean, just the fact that you have to teach to the lowest common denominator right there says a lot. I also think that when you mass educate people, it forces people to learn in a certain way and basically to memorize information. And does that make you a good employee? No. So what we decided between my wife and I is that's not what we wanted. We wanted to make sure, again, that we could raise kids that had that innate curiosity as much as possible that could learn from what we were doing around us with us. So then at 18, they could kind of control their own destiny, do what they wanted. Now, where we lie on the homeschool, unschooling spectrum, I'm not totally sure yet. We're kind of playing around with a bunch of things. My youngest or my oldest daughter is just now kindergarten age, so we're trying things. And it amazes me how much kids learn without you actually teaching them. 
you know, my daughter the other day just starts writing down some stuff, you know, like doing the letters and can write her name. Mm Mm-hmm. We never taught her to write letters. We never showed her how to do that. She just picked it up. So I think part of this other system of schooling is it doesn't challenge kids. It, it forces it forces kind of ageism upon them. You know, you're five, so you have to learn stuff that five-year-olds learn. Well, what if they want to learn something more advanced? They can't in that system. And if my daughter wants to learn, like she's really into taking photos now and doing videos. So let her pursue that. Why not? You know, there's people making full-time careers out of that. If she could cultivate that now, all the better. You know, my other daughter is really into kind of collecting stuff and, and starting to draw. Well, let's pursue that. So it really came down to, I guess, at the end of the day, if I had to boil this all down, I think I and my wife, who's really dedicated can do a better job of preparing my kids for the future than a bunch of teachers over the course of 18 years who are also trying to teach 25 other kids at the same time, at the same level. No offense to whoever any of those 25 people are, but I think I can do a better job than they can just given the fact that it's one-on-one and I know the person really well who's learning and I can control the opportunity where they don't know everybody as well. It's not one-on-one and they have to play by the rules of the system and I don't. Yeah. Well, and I think you just said that you can provide a lot of different opportunities and you can in a school setting, even so most people think, oh, you have to go to school because, you know, there's this and that. But and, and there's a place um, I did homeschool my children as well. And my daughter went to our high school, which was half homeschool and half school. So they had then access to labs and, you know, stuff like that. And that was great at that point. But There are a lot of kids I know which never went to school, like my oldest son, and did very well with whatever they decided to do in their later life. So, yeah, I second that motion, that it's a good idea. (laughs) Yeah, and, you know, it's from hearing stories of people like you and other people that have done this in the past, that has given me the confidence. Because initially, I mean, my thought was like, how do these kids learn discipline? How do they do all this? And I interviewed Ben Hewitt, who wrote that book. And through interviewing him and reading his book, that really paradigm shifted me. And then talking to people, I saw that. And I'm not a non-school evangelist. Like, I am not homeschool or bust forever. If it looks like it's not working out, if it gets to the point where our daughter wanted to go to school, I'll help her find or we'll step in and try and find a a school that would work. I'm trying to keep all options open, but I'm at least starting with this vector, especially when they're the youngest. I feel like this is when the egg is the most fragile. This is when you can kind of afford the most time at home. And then later on, if they need to get specific skills or learn things, like you said, in labs or more advanced stuff that we just don't have the knowledge for, I get that because you've at least built that core. And I think that core is what's important, the inquisitiveness, the communication skills, the problem-solving skills, the desire to learn, those innate things that you can't teach, you just cultivate them over time. Right, yeah. Are you familiar with John Holt? He passed away, but he... No. Yeah, he wrote several books on unschooling. He came from being a teacher. He basically was behind the beginning of the big homeschool movement in the United States. And one of his things was, is children learn. They want to learn. All you have to do is step out of their way, (laughs) you know, and and allows it to happen. But I also believe that it's not for everybody. And for some children, it's very wonderful that schools exist. So I, I wouldn't want to do away with them at this point where we are at as society. But for people which have the desire, I think it's it's at least some to explore and to look into. Well, uh, you know, well, one thing off that, it's not for every parent either. I think there's a lot of work involved. And I emphasize a lot, a lot of work. 
my wife does the predominant share of it now because I'm still working a corporate job and I'm away four days a week, eight hours a day. So she's into it. She spends a lot of time, does a lot of researching, does a lot of preparation to do it. And without her, it would be really hard. So whoever that primary parent is that stays at home with them, if you can do that, I, I'm fully cognizant that a lot of people aren't in the economic situation where they can do that. So, you know, your first step would be, you know, put yourself in that economic situation or work towards it. But if you do take it on, it, it's like a lot of things in life. It's a lifestyle. If you're homeschooling, at least it has been for us at this point, you are committed to doing it. It's not just mail it in. The kids do nothing all day. There's some effort involved along the way. So you're right. Not for every kid. Also, not for every parent. Yeah, I always felt that. It's the hardest thing about homeschooling is that you are never alone. You you never have a clean house, <laughs> you know. And <laughs> a lot of times you don't get to pursue what you want to do. Kind of like how you felt when you know you had your first daughter. It's like oh, now I don't get to do anymore what I want to do. And that kind of continues if you don't have that chunk of time where your child is taken care of by somebody else. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, that's today I was just thinking about this. Like, I won't sit down until well after this interview for my day, and I've been up since four. So I, I'm okay with that, though. Like, that's the life I've chosen to live. And my kids in the morning, when they usually get up, they, they'll they watch something early in the morning. So I don't like to inundate them with TV. And as much as I'd love to sit and watch a movie with them later in the day, you know, before dinner or after dinner, well, if they watch TV early in the morning, we don't like to put it on later in the day. So a lot of my sit down time, my movie time with them, I just give up and do other things. You know, it's a trade off. I, I think as a parent, that's one hard reality that maybe I never thought of or people don't accept like, oh, you're not going to have to give up that much. And it's like, yes, you are. At least for me, you know, we have three kids. I think three is the hardest number. Um, it, it, you know, maybe if you had multiples the same age, you know, you have quintuplets or something like that, that would be tough. But if you're just having standard births, you know, a year and a half, mm -hmm. two years apart, at four kids, one kid's older, they can help out. I think that's, that's a little easier than three. Yeah. So when I my kids were little, I was in the Leche League where there are a lot of people which were very dedicated to families. And they always say it's the first child is the hardest on the father. The second one is the hardest on the first one. And the third one is the hardest on the mother. Because when you have three, that's it. You're overruled. <laughs> you know, there are more of them than of you. And then, yes, as you have more, then the older ones help. But we were five when I grew up and my my older brother certainly had to help. But I don't know if that is ideal either. You know, there is everybody has to find their own balance, I suppose. And yeah, children having children is not easy. I totally agree. No, I'm in go mode, you know, twenty four seven it seems like. I'm either holding somebody, playing with somebody, or picking something up from the time I'm home because my wife is doing the exact same thing and you know, you better have a strong relationship too if you have a lot of kids because that's one other thing that, that can be hard to maintain throughout all this is the relationship gets strained or, or probably strengthened, um, but also strained by having a lot of kids because it's just divide and conquer. Like you said, at three kids, one person's overwhelmed. And, you know, when I come home, I'm either taking the two older ones or I'm taking the baby. And that sometimes puts us in different locations. So it can be tough, but it's it's all fun. And I and again, I always remind myself and I try and remind my wife, we will look back, as I said earlier in this episode, we'll look back and wish that you were dealing with this chaos again at some point in life. Yeah, absolutely. So empty nest syndrome is real. You know, when you have dedicated your life to your children and suddenly everybody is gone and the ironic thing is if you do a good job as a parent 
then your children are happy to go on and do their own thing. Not to say that you're not close and, you know, like right now all my children live within five minutes of my house. So we, we see each other all the time. But you don't want a child which still has to rely on you when they are 25. Do you have any strategies to keep your relationship as a couple strong? <laughs> Probably not good ones. Uh, other than just trying to communicate, I, you know, again, that sounds cliche, that sounds cheesy. I don't think people do it enough, have open, honest communication to make sure everybody's on the same page. You know, I try and really support my wife, not just by doing stuff, but just reminding her that she's doing a good job. Because I think, again, it sometimes she feels like she is drowning and just saying, hey, you are doing good. Because at the core, and I, I'm not saying this to say it, and I wouldn't say it just to say it to her, she is unbelievable in terms of being a mother, in terms of the work that she puts in, her dedication. I couldn't switch roles with her, and I'm just not that person. And she is, and that's great. So I think we try and have fun with it. We try and laugh through it. I think we were strong before we had kids. We didn't rush into kids. We had been together a while, so we essentially had had our fun, if you will, being uh, kidless. And then just try and take some time to do things together. Um, but that's that's few and far between. So I, I don't know. I don't have any great, great tips here other than, you know, we're always constantly talking and trying to gauge the pulse of the other person and, and probably just bail the other person out if somebody feels like they're overwhelmed. If I'm overwhelmed watching the kids or doing work, she tries to help me and vice versa. And that probably helps keep the relationship strong versus me, you know, just going outside or going to play golf or something like that and leaving her alone. You know, it's probably these little unspoken things that they're not really tactics. It's more just each of our approach in terms of how we make decisions. Like we're not going to leave the other person high and dry that help keep the relationship strong and don't leave anybody feeling like they're bearing the brunt of the load. Actually, I think you said some very profound things here. So the first one is the communication, because I think that's um, which goes to the wayside in so many families that it's just not coming from so hard anymore. It stays on the surface a lot and it can happen very easily when you're so busy with work and kids and, you know, all those different things. And the other thing, which I think is huge, is keep telling her that she is doing really good and is amazing. Because having been a mother at home at one point in my life, I think it's not only difficult because you're constantly dealing with little children, so you don't have the adult conversation going on, but you're also doing a job which is kind of thankless in a way in terms of how society looks upon it because you're not getting paid in money obviously you're not doesn't count towards your social security earnings or anything it doesn't count towards furthering your career and this is some I think a lot of women have experienced if you go somewhere and people usually ask what do you do and if somebody says I'm a mother then you kind of get that reaction, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Next, <laughs> you know, it's it's not something where people want to come around and say, oh, you know, this is such an amazing thing. And I think that's some, we really undervalue the role of mothers and of parents. And that's kind of why I really wanted to talk to you about that, because I feel you're valuing that role very strongly, both that of a father and that of a mother. You know, I think that's really important. No, you're you're dead on. And I am 100% with you there. You know, they, we as a society don't value moms. And, and I'll say this again, because I, I don't think people that don't have kids or who aren't in this position get it. It is a 24-7 on job, 24-7, every day in the week, tired, sick, stressed out, doesn't matter. Somebody is calling for you. Is anybody going to say thanks? Nope. They're only going to demand more and more and more. 
They're not going to say please. They're not going to say thank you. They just want it. Deep down, it's just the person you have to be if you want to do that and raise good kids. And it's funny, you know, the the whole push to have anybody work outside the home. So let's just not say this is encouraging women to go into the workforce, but to not have parents stay home one or both. Effectively, if both parents go work outside the home, you end up just outsourcing raising your kids to the school system or whomever. And it's like, well, what's more important, your career or your career as a parent? Again, maybe not everybody's cut out to be a parent, but I'm with you. I think it's very critical and a very thankless yet so important role uh, for mostly moms. I mean, they're typically the ones that stay home and do the work and it's undervalued work. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for giving all that acknowledgement. So, Jago, is there something else you would like to say about being a father or the role of the family in society? Yeah, I mean, well, maybe here's another thought going back to your previous question of how do we make it work. I mean, one thing that we have done a good job of, and maybe this will help people, is acknowledge our roles. You know, if you think permaculture, every species has its own functions, it has its niche within the system. Well, my wife and I are both pretty aware of what our roles are. My wife is better with the kids. If the kids have an issue, they're going to go to her. So naturally that means, okay, what does that leave me doing? I pick up the slack when she can't handle the kids. I pick up the house. I do the cooking. I do all those types of things. And it comes down to kind of a systems management thing. Like I'm faster at picking up. I'm faster at cooking. I'm faster at doing other things than her. If she's doing those things, it's kind of a misuse of our time. Similarly, if I'm trying to calm down our baby daughter when she's crying, I'm going to be struggling doing it. And if my wife's trying to cook at the same time, that's a misallocation of roles. So we're really cognizant of that. And I think that helps keep stress levels down as we both both do our things. And that just works well as a unit. Some other things that have really hit me pretty hard that I think have helped me become a better father as of very recently, like as in 2016, here we are in November, but this is 2016 stuff is one, I try to never be on my phone around my kids. I do not want them to catch me looking at my phone. This is a big thing for me. I talk about it all the time. I think it's huge. Too many people are buried in their phone all the time. If your kids see you doing that, what are they thinking? And they may not say it now, but I guarantee that's having an effect on them and they will think about it later in life and it will think about them. Especially if your kid is asking you to do something and you're saying just a minute while you flip through Instagram or something else. So I try never to be on my phone around them. And the other thing, speaking of Instagram, is I was going through Instagram one night and I read something where a guy who's into fitness basically said, you should never drink around your kids. And that hit me hard. Not that I was a big drinker, but I would casually drink around them. And from then on, it was basically, okay, I'm not doing that. And then shortly after, I just totally stopped drinking, period. So that's been huge. I now thinking back, it sounds crazy that I would have ever even drank around them. I'm not talking about getting S phase drunk. I'm talking about just having a beer, having any sort of buzz around kids. I, I think we take it for granted. You know, at family reunions, parties, Christmas parties, holidays, all that type of stuff. There's a lot of alcohol flowing. There's a lot of kids around. I don't know that that's the best example to set. So to each their own, but those are a few things that have worked for me and that I think are important to me. You know, everybody can make their own decision on that. Yeah. I mean, I don't drink, period. So that's, I, you know totally can see that and I think the phone is definitely that's a huge tip because people really are too much addicted to that and it really says my phone is more important than you you know that's that's basically what it means if your kid asks you something so yeah thank you for that I mean here's a question for you and I to kind of turn it around a little bit you having raised kids 
kids who don't live in your house. I mean, what is your biggest regret of how you raised your kids or something you would change looking back? For me, I I was very much in the same situation you were in, said I had no family around, so it was just me. And our financial situation wasn't very great either. And I got really stressed out at one point, you know, I felt very overwhelmed. I think it took me quite a long time to not put my standards towards where I thought my mom would want me to be, you know, how you see yourself through the lens of your parents and you have this idea as how things should be instead of just flowing with how things are, <laughs> you know, does it make sense at all? No, no, it does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that, you know, I wished I could have gotten to that point earlier to to just be absolutely okay and not wishing for having, you know, more in this respect and that. Because I think stress can really make it more difficult to be around your kids. And I was around them all the time. I literally had no breaks. Or if it was a break, I would have a friend. We would exchange babysitting but or, you know, taking care of our kids. But not having my kids for a little while would mean that then I would have her four so then, you know, I have seven kids. Uh, so I wasn't really getting big breaks. And maybe also not having learned earlier to reach out and to just go to a neighbor and say, hey, can you just come for half an hour and help out? Just be there. So there's another adult in the house. But yeah, I'm really happy with how my kids turned out. And I'm really happy with our relationship. Like I said, we're very close. We spent a lot of time together in we like each other. And to me, that's really important because that wasn't necessarily true for my birth family. We are not close. I mean, this day and age with Skype and, and internet and so forth, even though they're physically far away, they're in Germany and Italy, it would be very easy to stay in touch, but we don't. So my kids hang out with each other and communicate on a regular basis and we all see each other. So I'm very happy with that. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's cool to hear and it's it's so important and hearing you say that it's funny how a lot of us put these stories into our head or these expectations of how we think we should do things, you know, hold it up to your parents standards as you said or society standards or somebody says you should do it this way and it just ends up creating stress because it's not who we are or how we want to do it. And it just doesn't seem to be working. And when you're fighting that, it creates so many issues. And then when you kind of let that go and just do how you think is best, it sounds like it got a lot easier. And I think that's part of where we are too, is we are not trying to hit any metrics or live up to anybody's standards. We're just trying to do the best we can. As I said earlier, you know, live up to what we think we're doing. Are we doing good or not? Do we feel like we're trying our best or not? You know, we're the judge and it, it is stressful. Um, I can't imagine seven kids around, <laughs> you know, it's doable. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, my husband comes from a Mormon background and a lot of his relatives have 10 children, 12 children. And yeah, I can't even imagine. I mean, I love my three, but and sometimes I feel when families are bigger, then the individuals are not that much taken care of, which can be good, too. You know, if you can just kind of be part of the crowd and, and nobody picks on you, <laughs> whatever. But yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that same thing too. But then part of me wonders, is that just because I'm not in that situation? I'm sure, you know, if you had that many kids, you'd you'd think differently. But I don't know. I've thought that too, because that's part of our debate of do you have more kids? At some point, your attention just gets diluted down more and more, or at least so it would appear on the surface. Maybe I'm missing something, but that's one of our thoughts of why to stop. At some point, you just can't spend as much time with five kids as you can with two or three. 
Absolutely, you can't. But you know, kids get older and then they get more and more and more independent, especially if that is what you're fostering. And when my children were seven, my oldest son was seven, it's a time I didn't really cook meat and he really wanted meat. And so as part of our homeschooling effort, I said, okay, you can use anything in the house. And we always had a lot of staples, you know, beans and, and stuff like that around. And I give you $5 and you can cook a meal and he became an expert shopper and with his seven years would create a meal once a week so they are actually quite capable of doing things probably way before we think they can because I think we kind of grew up more well I grew up where we had chores very early but a lot of kids now are removed from life a little bit does it make sense you know, like you said, have the tablet and be on the computer and have math skills maybe, but not so much life skills. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. I'm with you. I'm with you. I've seen a lot of kids that I question what their parents are doing because these kids don't know a lot of these life skills or basic things. And you said kids know a lot more than we give them credit for. I mean, one thing that blew my mind, I mean, blew my mind when we had our first daughter was how much of a person a one-year-old was. For some reason I had in my head till you were like three or four, you were still a baby, a toddler. But I never realized how quickly kids advanced and gained knowledge and skills and size and, and ability from everything from motor skills to intellectual skills. That absolutely blew my mind. I mean, every day it seems like one of my daughters does something that I'm like, oh, why are you doing that? Like, you, you, I didn't think you could do that at this age. And they are surprising. So I, that's why I think, you know, public school that caters to the lowest common denominators is a danger. So why not challenge your kids the other way? Push them towards the highest that they can be, you know, challenge them to do stuff that's above their skill level. And when they struggle with it, support them in the struggle and push them to go for it. Because I think they're curious. I think they want to learn. I think they, like you said, they're, they're just kind of learning machines. They're curiosity machines. And we need to help them feed that machine and seek it out. And I think they'll take it from there. You know, it's like a vegetable seed. You plant it, it wants to grow. Give kids stuff that they want to learn about, they'll learn. Just let them run with it. Yeah, I think you don't need to push kids at all. You just need to provide learning opportunities. You know, because that's probably kind of what you're saying. Give them something you don't even think they could comprehend and be surprised how quickly they learn that. No, exactly. Like my daughter, we gave her an old video camera that we have and she's five. And my initial thought is this thing's way too complex. She's going to break it. She's not going to be able to handle it. And then I thought, well, who cares? This thing's just sitting on a shelf. And now she can navigate around that thing better than I can at five. So there's just an example. Yet You're right. You're not pushing them. You are just providing them tools to allow them to push themselves and they'll just run with it. Absolutely. Yeah. Jago, is there something else on your mind you want to share? No, I mean, I, mean, I guess in regards to the learning, one little subtlety that I've probably come to realize that I think helps is... You need to listen to your kids and pick up on some of the nuance that's happening, the subtleties, the things that they might not outwardly say. If your kid's expressing an interest in something and you want to challenge them, if you want them to push their limits, they're not going to say, hey, I want to read Shakespeare. They'll be, oh, I'm into acting or whatever. Well, give them something that allows them to stretch given that curiosity. It's very easy to just gloss past it or say like, oh, that's silly. You know, you don't want to learn how to polish shoes. Why would you want to do that? That's dumb. You know, give them the shoe polish. Let them polish shoes. That's what they want to do. Let them follow that. It's easy to dismiss it as this is crazy. They're not old enough. This is an outlandish idea, but provide those opportunities. You know, the other kind of point I would say just to close it out is, you know, think about what parent you want to be. 
And I think that's a hard question that we all need to ask ourselves. It's a lifestyle. Everything that you do goes to that. And you can decide every day if you want to be better or if you want to stay the same. And I think it's a continuous quest to become a better parent and enjoy it along the way. You're not going to be perfect. You just try the best you can. But there's a big difference between doing bare minimum and really trying. And I always push people or at least myself to try to be better than average. Definitely. And we always will make mistakes, but it's okay as long as you have the best intention. And I like what you said to really think about what kind of parent do I want to be? Yeah, I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. I hope it helped some people out there. And I think there's a lot of potential. You know, if we're all better parents, we can make better kids, raise better kids. And I think that helps everybody overall. So I'm happy to share it. And I'm somebody who started far, far, far from perfect. And I'm not perfect now, but I've come a long way. And I think I've shocked myself to where I've evolved to because this is not where I started. Yeah, I like that you shocked yourself. <laughs> it's good to shock <laughs> ourselves sometimes. <laughs> no, it is. It is. Probably can tell that Diego and I had a lot to say to each other. Children, homeschooling, how to show up in this world, uh, topics which are really close to both of our hearts. I hope you're checking out Diego and his various enterprises. If you Google Permaculture Voices or go to permaculturevoices.com, you are going to come to his landing page and find all the different enterprises Diego is involved in. There are courses you can take. You can subscribe, obviously, to his newsletter and to his different podcasts. He is calling this Diego Footers, Creative Deconstruction. There are different podcast tracks. One of the ones I listen to on a very regular basis is his daily podcast, where it's Diego talking about things on his mind, and I find it very interesting. There are times I agree, there are times I vehemently disagree, but it's always good to get thinking about something, right? So I really hope you check out Diego. On News on Our Sites, the Sustainable Living Podcast, we are now on Patreon. And actually, you can support Diego on Patreon as well. And you can support us. So we all can show up in the world, hopefully bringing you information you really enjoy. So to donate on Patreon, you go to patreon.com. And then look for the show. So our show is Sustainable Living Podcast. Jacobs is under Permaculture Voices. Even if you give $1 a month, it makes a big difference. It helps us to keep bringing programs to you. Thank you so much for supporting the independent podcasters, your indie podcaster. We truly believe that we are the voice of the future. Said right now, the way the world is, a lot of people feel very disenchanted with politics, with news, with everything in between. And in our world, the podcasting world, the permaculture world, the sustainable living world, we are going to show up. We are showing up right now and we keep going to show up as people who want to bring our integrity forward and do the best we can in the world. So hopefully you feel that's worthy of support. Thank you so much for listening.